Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar titled The State of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, What Does It Mean for Local Municipalities? My name is Shawnee Alphorn and I'm with the Local Government Commission. We would like to first thank our funder for this webinar, the California Endowment. As everyone this webinar may already know, this year the State of California will, be, will begin implementing the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It is critical to this historic legislation um, to assess that local municipalities embrace the SGMA as an opportunity to, opportunity to improve their community's resilience against future water crisis. Only by fully engaging in the sustainable groundwater sustainable agencies formation process can local leaders ensure their community's concerns are addressed in resulting groundwater sustainability plans. Our webinar today will feature three speakers who will be providing an update on the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and will be discussing the impact to local governments and planning agencies. We will also be diving into the importance of stakeholder engagement when discussing the potential health impacts to our water. Before we get started, I want to go over a few logistics. Everyone will be muted except the person speaking. Due to the large number of participants, we ask that you type your question comment into the question box. We will be summarizing those questions during the Q&A portion following the presentations. Any of the questions we don't get to, we'll ask presenters to respond to after the, the webinar and we will make the responses available on our website. All speaker presentations and the recording from this webinar will be available on our website a couple of days after the webinar. Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an attendee in listen-only mode. So now we will move forward with our first speaker for today, Trevor Joseph. He is the supervising engineering geolo geologist for the California Department of Water Resources. Trevor has over 18 years of combined experience providing environmental and water resources consulting services to private and public sector clients, and more recently working for the Department of Water Resources on legislative mandated programs and projects. His experience has focused primarily on water resources planning and groundwater development, conducting projects pertaining to conjunctive use planning and implementation, including aquifer storage and recovery, as well as groundwater supply, uh, water well drilling, and general groundwater research. He is the project manager for DWR's Sustainable Groundwater Management Program and has previously implemented and managed DWR's Integrated Regional Water Management Grant Program. Trevor holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from California State University, Sacramento. Now we'll turn it over to Trevor. Great, thank you very much and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, next slide, please. So my presentation today, I would like to focus specifically on what are called groundwater sustainability plan regulations and alternatives to those regulations. This is one of the projects that we are actively working on and a very important project that we have uh, related to Sigma implementation. I'll also touch on just the outreach, the informal outreach that we've conducted to date as it relates to groundwater sustainability plan regulations. I'll highlight the, an overview of the land use components related to these sustainability plan regulations. And then I will touch on GSA formation, groundwater sustainability agency formation, and some of the changes that have come about uh, recently in regards to Senate Bill uh, 13. Next slide. So just a brief overview, and I think there's some animation in here. If you could hit that one more time, I'd appreciate it. Um, California's major groundwater milestones, and certainly this doesn't reflect everything, but kind of the highlights uh, over the last 20, 25 years. As many of you are aware, groundwater management planning has been with California for a while. Um, in legislation, it, it initially occurred in AB 3030 back in 1992, was updated in Senate Bill 1938 in 2002. There's been a series of other programs related to groundwater that the department has been involved with that are shown here on the timeline. Um, and then Sigma is now, uh, became effective January 1st, 2015, and really changed how groundwater 
uh, management will uh, occur in the future. And some of those changes are highlighted here on the bottom. So prior to Sigma, in large part, groundwater management was a voluntary uh, requirement. And groundwater management plans have historically been developed just to uh, service area planning boundaries. And what that's resulted in is a lot of, of smaller efforts, if you will, that are not base and wide. However, in some cases, counties or cities have created larger groundwater management planning efforts. There's been, frankly, minimal implementation. Uh, there are great groundwater management plans out there, and folks have done a lot as a re result uh, of groundwater management. But frankly, there has also been kind of um, spotty coverage in terms of groundwater management in California. And uh, this was all been due to it, the fact that it's a voluntary requirement uh, and funding and other, other, other uh, related activities. Um, the groundwater management to date has, has primarily been kind of a carrot approach, if you will, um, that there's been grant incentives to uh, encourage groundwater management that have enabled many folks to, to make progress to date. But now with the enactment of Sigma, um, groundwater management in many basins is a, a requirement. Uh, requires that the entire basins are covered. Uh, Sigma provides these groundwater sustainability agencies new authority and responsibility. And now there's a state backstop that doesn't exist with the Department of Water Resources, but the State Water Resource Control Board. So it really has uh, transformed and changed uh, how groundwater management will be conducted in the future. Next slide, please. So who, who does this apply to? There's 515 groundwater basins or sub-basins in the state of California. They're shown here in the, uh, the blue. Uh, next slide, please. And although Sigma applies to all those 515, only the 127 high and medium priority basins defined by the department are required to address these new groundwater sustainability plan or groundwater sustainability agency requirements. And so this table just shows that uh, those 127 high and medium priority basins make up about 96% of the average annual groundwater supply in the state. And as of 2010, represented about 88% of the overlying population of groundwater basins in the state. Next slide, please. So just a real high level overview of Sigma, it's titled here, Groundwater Sustainability Plan and Alternative Regulations, but really this is Sigma in general in terms of what are the roles and responsibilities of these three entities. So again, the Department of Water Resources, we are the regulatory arm and also provide technical assistance as it relates to Sigma implementation. Local agencies can form to be groundwater sustainability agencies and they're responsible for the planning and implementation of these groundwater sustainability plans or alternatives. And then the board, as I mentioned previously, they're really the enforcement or the backstop um, element or entity within Sigma. Next slide, please. So we always show this slide in almost every presentation and we, we start out by, by recognizing that people really can't read this and we understand that. We hope that folks go to the link there at the top uh, because we think that this is a great document if you had one document to kind of work through the major milestones of Sigma over the next 10 years, this is a great starting point. Um, this document also provides, it's color coded as to, of those three entities just discussed, who, um, who's responsible for each milestone. And the purple are both state board and uh, DWR uh, joint activities. Uh, today, again, focus a little more intently on the GSP alternative regulations due June 1st, 2016. The alternatives then um, to GSPs, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, are due June, excuse me, January 1st, 2017. And then regular GSPs, if you will, are due either January 30, 31st, 2020 or 31st, uh, 2022. And I'll explain the differences there. Next slide. So by June 1st, 2016, as I mentioned, the department is required to adopt regulations for evaluating groundwater sustainability plans, implementation of groundwater sustainability plans, and coordination agreements where multiple plans are developed in a basin or sub-basin. 
Um, I think there's some animation if you could hit it one or two more times. The regulation shall identify the required plan components, additional plan components or elements, coordination of multiple GSPs in the basin, and other information that will assist local agencies in developing and implementing GSPs. And I apologize, I'm in the conference room and my computer just went blank, so I cannot see where we're at. Um, and the department may update these regulations to uh, incorporate best management practices. And best management practices are outside of the regulations. Um, it's a technical assistance document as described in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. But um, you could think of these as certainly best management practices uh, as ways to approach uh, regulations that go beyond the minimum requirements established in the regulations. So again, I apologize, my computer's still blank. Um, if, let me see if I can bring it up here, give me 30 seconds. All right, my network went down. I'm back up, so next slide please. So I mentioned GSPs and alternatives. Uh, here's just a description at a high level in terms of what the differences are between these. One, uh, GSPs, all, again, high medium priority basins need to be covered by either a GSP or an alternative to a GSP. Um, in both cases, GSPs, whether it's one or multiple, need to cover the entire basin or sub-basin. Um, if there's multiple, it requires a coordination agreement. GSPs can be submitted only by GSAs, and I'll explain GSAs again in, in more depth here in a few slides. There's an annual reporting requirement. There's a five-year evaluation, and as I mentioned, the dates uh, for submittal to the department uh, vary depending upon whether or not the basin has been deemed subject to critical overdraft or if it's just a, another high and medium priority basin. So alternatives um, in our thinking is that it's likely that an alternative applies to very few uh, local agencies um, is one of the following items listed here. Either an existing groundwater management plan that covers the entire basin or sub-basin that essentially you could say is functionally equivalent to what will be needed in a GSP. And based on our review of existing groundwater management plans, one, not many cover the entire basin or sub-basin. And, and many, as I mentioned previously, haven't been implemented or developed that would be technically equivalent to a GSP. So we don't feel that there's probably many existing GMPs that fit into this category, um, but possibly. Um, a new adjudication or this analysis that a basin has been operated to a sustainable yield for a period of 10 years. Um, and uh, we will provide the description of the technical requirements of that option in, in these regulations. Um, needs to be CASGEM compliant. I'm not sure how many folks are familiar with the CASGEM program. The department uh, started a few years ago based on legislation. Essentially, it's a requirement to provide groundwater elevation data um, in order to receive uh, grant funds, to be eligible for state grant funds. And so uh, these, to be a eligible, uh, a basin needs to be CASGEM compliant. And finally, there's uh, annual and five-year reporting requirements. And as I showed on that timeline, uh, the alternatives need to be submitted by January 1st, uh, 2017. So our regulations uh, will describe the requirements for each of these GSPs and alternative plans. Next slide, please. So there's three options uh, in order to cover entire basin. There's one GSA. And if you could just work through all the uh, animation, I appreciate it. And then one more. Thank you. So there's an option of one GSA, Groundwater Sustainability Agency, covering the entire basin or sub-basin with one GSP. There's an option in Sigma for many GSAs to come together uh, to cover a basin or sub-basin with one GSP. Or there's a third option here that many GSAs can develop uh, multiple GSPs, but they're required to uh, complete a coordination agreement that's called out in uh, statute in Sigma and will be described in more detail in our regulations. Next slide, please. So at the, at the heart of Sigma as it relates to 
the groundwater sustainability plan requirements are these series of terms. Um, sustainability goal, sustainable groundwater management, sustainable yield, and then what are called undesirable results. And they're really undesirable when they're at significant and unreasonable levels. And these undesirable results are these six items uh, shown below. Surface groundwater depletion, reduction of storage, degraded quality, water quality, seawater intrusion, land subsidence, and chronic lowering of groundwater levels. Now, SIGMA doesn't provide a definition of what's significant and reasonable. Um, and it's, it's left up to uh, the department to articulate how to approach defining this in the groundwater sustainability plan regulations. Um, the way we're looking at this is that these are all somewhat interrelated, these four items, sustainability goals, sustainable groundwater management, and sustainable yield. In particular, sustainable yield, uh, the requirement that agencies or basins need to be operating to a sustainable yield no later than 2040 or 42, um, points at that there can be no um, significant or reasonable undesirable results at that time related to these six items. So I guess what I'm trying to articulate is there's really, you're looking at these six items in terms of compliance as it relates uh, to the groundwater sustainability plan and sustainable groundwater management. If agencies um, are avoiding and managing these undesirable results, um, they are ultimately going to be operating to a sustainable yield, uh, completing sustainable groundwater management and, and reaching a sustainability goal. It's not that simple. There's more detail to the regulations for sure, but again, just to get at the heart of the matter in terms of, of really measuring um, impacts, it's related to these six items. Next slide, please. So that's just a brief overview of, of the topic of GSP regs and alternatives. Um, so now I'll describe how what we've been doing to date in terms of our implementation of these emergency regulations. So this slide uh, shows obviously a timeline. Above the timeline bar, we've been approaching outreach uh, and communication with stakeholders in this four-phase process and actually completion of the project in this four-phase process. The phases aren't listed here by number, but the first phase is scoping. We had a lot of meetings with stakeholders and advisory groups to, to identify issues and challenges related to uh, sustainability plan regulations. We spent a lot of time this summer, uh, what we call this draft framework stage, and I'll go into that in more detail uh, in terms of meeting with advisory groups and stakeholders to really understand the issues and challenges. Um, we're in this third phase right now, drafting emergency regulations and we hope to, well, we will be in front of the California Water Commission this Thursday and possibly December to articulate uh, and get them up to speed in terms of what's been discussed this summer. We hope to have draft uh, emergency regulations out in the January, possibly early February timeframe. Uh, after that time period, we will have a um, uh, public comment uh, period uh, of, of at least 30 days in a series of public meetings that are required in statute uh, and then work towards hopefully drafting uh, final and uh, adopting emergency regulations before June 1st, 2016, which then need to be submitted to the Office of Administrative Law. Um, again, as noted on the bottom here, dates and durations are all subject to change. Uh, this is very much an iterative process and uh, we don't have uh, hard dates uh, on almost anything. Next slide, please. So I, I, for those of you that have attended some of our advisory group meetings, you're probably almost sick of the slide and you've seen it quite a few times. Um, in terms of the first two phases, that scoping phase, we identified at least 10 topics to discuss with advisory uh, groups and uh, different stakeholders. Those are shown here on this, uh, around this wheel. Um, I won't describe each one, um, but certainly we had discussions related to land use, county, and city involvement. Um, there was so much to discuss this summer uh, that we actually broke them up into these three batches. And I also want to point out that these aren't legislatively mandated uh, meetings or, or discussions. These were really for our benefit. They were our meetings so that we could really understand the, uh, the issues and challenges from the stakeholder perspective 
around these topics. And so we really appreciated uh, all the time and energy that the stakeholders uh, provide in terms of meeting with us and, and giving us feedback on these topics. Um, I also want to point out that there is a discussion paper on our website related to each one of these topics. Uh, this discussion paper is draft. It will never be uh, deemed final. The, the whole purpose of the discussion paper was to have something in writing so that we could kind of focus that discussion. But if you're interested in more detail on, on each of these topics, please visit our website. Next slide, please. So just a summary of that outreach that we had this summer um, by batch. Here's the advisory groups that we met with uh, on the left-hand column. Um, in addition to these advisory groups that we also met with periodically with just different water agencies or groups that are not listed here, um, represented a lot of time. Again, we appreciate it. Um, we felt that we really got a lot of information uh, out of these meetings. And again, although not legislatively mandated, uh, we feel that it, uh, it was time well spent. Next slide, please. And there's a series of animation here, but I, um, you could actually walk through uh, the, the animation and I'll, uh, I'll just articulate everything when you're done. Um, so this is really translating then that phase two, that discussions we've had with all the uh, advisory groups and, and other stakeholders to making it practical in draft emergency regulations. And so now we're, we're transitioning to that third phase. We're drafting the regulations. And we feel that there is what we're going to call potential regulation content because nothing has been released yet. Uh, but we definitely feel there's a series of chapters or, or uh, components, if you will, kind of in the middle column. And they can kind of be grouped, if you will, uh, on the left. So there's certainly a governance and coordination aspect to the emergency regulations. You know, at its fundamental base or, or question is, you know, who is managing and participating in um, GSP development and implementation? And so there's a governance coordination and land use component there at a minimum. The next one, basin setting, you know, what are the current conditions? This is so important for determining what needs to be done, you know, obviously into the future, and what is required to be done in the future. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion here around basin uh, Con conditions that needs to be in the regulations. Sigma planning, so how will groundwater be managed and measured into the future? So this is more looking forward in terms of setting things up. Um, a sustainability goal, measurable objectives, undesirable results that I described on our previous slide and monitoring plan, all major components of, of the emergency regulations. The evaluation piece here in terms of implementation and reporting, if you could hit the animation one more. And then there's these, these other elements, the uh, equivalent GSPs, these alternatives that, that I've described on a previous slide, and what are we were calling fringe areas, which are really small areas outside of an adjudication, kind of a special consideration that I apologize, I don't have a slide to really describe that, but um, these are also elements that, that we need to address in emergency regulations. And then if you could hit the animation one more time, this is just kind of flanging up then all that discussion that we had this summer as it relates to those topics and how that input we feel is benefiting us in terms of understanding uh, the components or the potential regulation content and components um, in the middle column. Next slide, please. So I have one slide on land use. And what I want to articulate here really is where land use is referred to in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and in government code. Uh, and then I'll describe some of the high level stakeholder, stakeholder comments we received related to land use. And a lot of this is from our third discussion paper, information picked up uh, from all those advisory group meetings. Certainly when I describe stakeholder comments, it, it doesn't represent all of that discussion and all the input we received. Certainly there, there's just not time for that. Um, so you may have had comments or input that's not reflected here, but that doesn't mean it's, it's forgotten or not uh, important. Um, so planning and land use. You know, review and consideration of groundwater requirements. So this is in the government code section. Before adoption or amendment of a city or county's general plan, 
the planning agency shall review and consider the GSP. Now, as it relates to SIGMA, the next two items, consideration of all beneficial uses and users of groundwater. GSA shall consider the interest of all beneficial uses and users of groundwater, including local land use planning agencies. And there's a list of beneficial users and, and uses and users of groundwater. Um, this is specifically in Chapter 4, not Chapter 6 of GSP regulations. But obviously, the link, local land use planning agencies is, uh, is a requirement here. Um, required GSP elements, GSP's description of consideration of county and general plans and how GSPs may affect the general plan. So this is a, a specific required element in the GSP regulations. So next uh, animation here. Thank you. Stakeholder comments. I'm going to read these because they're, they're pretty important. GSP should describe how local land use and planning agencies were engaged by a GSA. Um, we're definitely going to be interested in how those interests were considered and engaged uh, in development of the GSP. Counties and cities should be a signatory to the governance structure of a GSA. Um, and again, these are stakeholders' comments. I, I do want to be careful that this is not our, an articulation of our approach in terms of what's going to be or should be in the regulations, but these, this is the uh, comments that we heard. GSA should provide technical information in a format for ease of use in planning decisions and general plans. GSA should recommend protection of recharge areas to local land use and planning agencies. And GSA should consider the reliance on, uh, and this really should say, land use and planning agency strategies and policies outside of GSA's bound, GSA boundaries. Um, there's other items here that are kind of uh, not articulated, like um, you know, providing early drafts of GSPs to local land use and planning agencies, insurance that uh, ongoing communication collaboration should be a, a requirement in the regs, and um, you know, a list of all planning agencies, relevant planning agencies, should be included uh, by the GSA. So there's, again, a lot of stakeholder comments that um, are applicable to, to this section. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to um, move to uh, the GSA formation. And so I have a series of slides here on GSA formation and some of the changes that uh, now have occurred because of Senate Bill 13. So just this is straight from from again from water code. I just wanted to point folks to some fundamentals here. You know, a, a groundwater sustainability agency means one or more local agencies implementing the provisions of Sigma. Um, the last bullet here defines what a local agency is. It, you know, means a local agency that has water supply, water management, or land use responsibilities within the basin. Next slide, please. I want to point out here that uh, local agencies must consider their service area boundaries when deciding to also become a GSA, and, but service area boundary is not defined in SIGMA. SIGMA also identified 15 exclusive local agencies that can manage groundwater with their statutory uh, boundaries, so in, in many cases the GSAs are already, already listed. Um, they, well, I shouldn't say they're listed. The agencies are listed. They still must form a GSA. Uh, and they can also opt out in the future. Next slide, please. So as we, um, well, ex sorry, a combination of local agencies may form a GSA by using any of the following methods, a JPA, MOU, or other legal agreement. Let's see. Uh, a local corporation regulated by the Public Utilities Commission or a mutual water company may participate in a GSA through a memorandum agreement or other legal agreement. And next slide. So then here are some of the uh, changes due to SB 13. Um, one is it removed the notice of intent to be a GSA, allows a mutual water company to be part of a GSA through a legal agreement, addresses GSA overlap, uh, which was occurring prior to um, SB 13. Many local agencies have claimed the same area and uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, concern in terms of who is the appropriate GSA. Uh, prior to SB 13, 
um, we were in a tight position because we had no authority to um, refute or um, sort out overlap. Uh, we still um, have limited authority, but SB 13 does not allow uh, for overlapping uh, GSA formation. Um, it addresses the service area boundary issue by saying something to the effect, and I'm sorry I don't have the exact, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but essentially that GSAs can uh, only, well, local agencies can only form GSAs to their service area boundary. Um, let's see. And I also want to highlight that DWR is not required is required to post all complete notices within 15 days. So we have a, a again a changed role now in that we are evaluating the completeness of uh, GSA formation. And um, prior to SB 13, we simply posted what uh, what was provided to us. Next slide, please. So again, the timeline, next steps. I just want to highlight as it relates to GSP regulations that, again, we will hope to be in front of the commission uh, not only this Thursday, but in the December commission meeting giving updates, possibly also the January uh, meeting. Please look to those um, public uh, meetings uh, in early next calendar year, and we're looking forward to comments on the draft regulations. Those meeting dates have not been determined yet, uh, but they will be on our, our website. Um, if you're interested in giving us comments to date, uh, just because we're out of phase two and we're actively working on developing draft emergency regulations, we still don't mind hearing from folks. And uh, if you have something in written form or you simply just want to contact me, um, we are certainly still collecting input. Next slide, please. And that's all I had. I wanted to just list the uh, web resources that the department has uh, prepared uh, to support Sigma implementation. And again, if you're interested on GSP emergency regulations in particular, it's the uh, second bullet here. Also, if you are not uh, a subscriber to our email distribution list, uh, that can be found here on the third bullet and we uh, provide periodic emails in terms of updates, whether it relates to GSP, uh, emergency regulations, or GSA formation, or, or all the projects that we're working on, basin boundary, emergency regulations, uh, all of those uh, notifications go out through that email distribution list. With that, I think, um, I think I'm done. Thanks, Trevor. Next up, we have Phoebe Seaton, co-founder and co-director of the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. As a not-for-profit advocacy organization, the Leadership Council represents lower-income communities in the San Joaquin Valley and Coachella Valley. Some of their key areas of focus are ensuring inclusion of rural communities and rural regions and statewide land use and investment strategies aimed at mitigating and adapting to climate change and promoting land use and investment decisions that secure basic services and amenities. Prior to launching Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, CB directed the Community Equity Initiative at California Urban Legal Assistance Incorporated and was the policy coordinator for issues related to water and land use at California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation. Phoebe received her JD from UCLA and her BA in history from UC Berkeley. Now I will hand it over to Phoebe. Thanks so much. I'm going to um, build on and hopefully set up the next presentation and focus a bit more on the relationship between um, local land use agencies and the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, as Trevor discussed, there are the uh, in terms of groundwater management plans, there are the GSPs, the Groundwater Sustainability Plans, and alternatives. And um, throughout the slides and the presentations, I'll be referring to groundwater sustainability plans and um, GSPs. Um, feel free to read into that the alternatives, but um, kind of along with what Trevor said, um, GSPs will be the most relevant planning document um, for for most of us. Go ahead, next next slide. Please. Um, so this is just kind of the basics and the takeaways from this conversation, which is the importance of engaging um, early and often 
in um, groundwater sustainability agency development and development of groundwater sustainability plans. Um, the, the, kind of the goals of, kind of local land use agencies and uh, other local agencies and the groundwater sustainability agencies should be in line. We're all looking for um, better and more sustainable planning and allocation of resources. I mean, it is very important that local planning agencies understand their role, very important role in this process, given the, the importance of land use in long-term sustainability of groundwater. Next slide, please. Um, so this again highlights that and highlighted in the legislation is that the legislature intended very clearly to link land use and water better than it has been linked in the past. Um, next next slide. Um, and this is a visual of this. We think that this is it is an end of the era where we can continue to grow and plan and develop um, kind of irrespective of water quality, water availability, et cetera, and we're going to have to start doing better as cities and counties and special districts um, in ensuring that our land use plan and our development plans are taking into account um, groundwater supplies, surface water supplies, and especially we'll talk about a little bit later on the needs not only of future development but of um, existing communities in our jurisdictions. Next slide. Um, this just uh, repeats some of Trevor's slides, the, that the uh, GSAs are required to take into consideration the interests of a variety, uh, the, a variety of parties, including local land use planning agencies, and disadvantaged communities and tribal interests. And just want to highlight that um, disadvantaged communities um, is a part of the, the interests of local land use planning agencies, but also need to be looked at specifically. Um, we're concerned that, um, or, or see the benefit and potential disadvantage that the way that these the GSAs are formed and GSPs develop can really benefit um, existing disadvantaged communities, but also could impede their sustainable development. So I want to pay close attention to those in your jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Again, this just highlights the collaboration and communication necessary for development of GSPs. Um, GSPs shall include, in collaboration with local agencies, a process to review land use plans um, to, to look at the impact on groundwater uh, quality and quantity. And again, highlighting that quality is also a consideration, along with quantity, throughout, um, throughout this legislation. Next slide. This is just a, um, a, a visual of a general plan. I want to talk a little uh, more specifically about the relationship between uh, SIGMA and uh, general plans and long-term planning is to really drive home that groundwater availability, groundwater quality, and the sustainability plans will have an impact on general plans now and in the future. So this again, um, before adoption or a substantial amendment of a general plan, the cities and counties must review and consider the groundwater sustainability plan, refer the proposed action to a groundwater sustainability agency, um, that, and um, we'll talk about a little bit about what the, the responsibility of the, of the GSA with this respect. But I want to note that it isn't explicit in the legislation, but the serious implications this could have for housing elements and for ensuring in terms of housing elements would be considered an update um, or an amendment of a general plan that local jurisdictions in doing their housing elements must consider the availability of water to um, ensure adequate water and quality to uh, anticipated housing development. And this again just highlights the responsibility of the GSA to engage in development of a general plan um, that the GSA must develop a report in anticipation of a, of a general plan amendment um, identifying the anticipated effect 
of the proposed amendment or um, general plan update or passage um, on the implementation and the success of the groundwater sustainability plan. So looking at the conformity, um, for lack of a better word, with the general plan um, growth projections and development projections with success of implementation of that groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, next slide. If you look at this highlights water code section 10726.4 and, and it outlines the various ways in which a groundwater sustainability agency can control groundwater um, extractions and um, proliferation of wells, et cetera, but the, there is a catch-all at the end that says there are otherwise establishing um, groundwater extraction allocations. And then as I think one of the key lines in the legislation those actions shall be consistent with the applicable elements of the city or county general plan unless there's insufficient sustainable yield in the basin to serve a land use, design, land use designated in the city or county general plan. There's, again, another catch-all that, that, that says that the GSAs don't have land use or, or planning authority. However, I think that kind of bears noting that the that a general plan cannot will not be able to go forward if there's an unsustainable yield to um, to to provide for the anticipated land uses. Next slide. This is a team effort. Um, I think that it's not just where I know that really want to drive home the importance of cities and counties engaging in this effort early on, but we really need broad participation from community residents, from folks who will be, who are and will be um, experiencing impacts to groundwater over the coming years, impacts to their um, access to groundwater as a result of groundwater sustainability plans, and in particular local governments that have a, a, a very important role in this. Um, we're talking not just cities and, and counties, of course, but also um, other other agencies such as the LAFCOs, COGS, MPOs, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, so the role of LAFCOs, what um, is has yet to be determined is the roles of LAFCOs in GSA development per se. So the what what the role of the LAFCO will be in assessing the, the, the boundaries, if any, um, JPAs to the extent that there are JPAs, but what very clear is that LAFCOs um, in determining city growth and community growth patterns will have to take into consideration the availability of water um, and, um, and groundwater sustainability plans. So it's again very important that LAFCOs participate as well um, and, and play a role in development of groundwater sustainability plans and take into consideration those plans in, um, in reviewing and assessing city county and community growth patterns, annexations, et cetera. Okay. Um, the, we also feel that the, um, the agencies in charge of allocating transportation funding and looking at long-term growth patterns, sustainable community strategies, et cetera, uh, must consider groundwater sustainability plans and availability of water to serve the long-term growth patterns identified in those sustainable community strategies as well as um, housing needs allocations. It says here, can housing and roads go where water doesn't flow? Um, what role are COGS and MPOs going to play, cities and counties as well, in ensuring that we're looking at all of these resources holistically? Um, we want to make sure that we're developing where, where there's going to be water, where people are, and that we have the water to provide for the housing that, that we know we need. Um, CSDs as well are, to the extent that they um, have a role in water supply and management, are of course um, necessary to the kind of effective development and implementation of GSPs, but they also must be involved to make sure that the, the counties in which they're located are, are ensuring adequate kind of water supply and adequate representation through the GSP process. 
So we really want to make sure that counties and CSDs in county areas are working together um, to ensure representation of those interests. Um, and just for, um, for those of you who might not know, um, LAFCOs, um, going back to LAFCOs, our local agency uh, formation commissions, are in charge of assessing um, and uh, determining the appropriateness of city and, and community growth. Um, so, for example, if a city wants to grow, expand its sphere of influence, it must go to LAFCO. And LAFCO does an assessment of whether or not whether there's um, infrastructure and services necessary to serve the um, expanded sphere. Similar to annexations, the LAFCOs will look to make sure that there's um, adequate infrastructure, et cetera, to um, to support the annexation and to make sure that the annexation and sphere of influence updates don't undermine um, kind of sustainable growth, sustainable growth patterns, leave communities out, um, facilitate conversion of prime farmland into urban uses, um, and generally support long-term long -term state planning priorities. Um, COGS and MPOs are um, our, our long-term planning organizations, one of their most important roles, or two of their most important roles, are um, allocating um, the transportation funding through regional transportation plans. And now, with the passage of SB 375 several years ago, creating sustainable community strategies, which look to address greenhouse gas reductions through long-term planning. And we really see the importance of, of their role in ensuring that water allocations are, um, are, are, are in line with those, with those growth patterns. That is M the role of MPOs. COGS are responsible for allocating housing um, throughout a region uh, and, and making sure that each jurisdiction within a region has its fair share of housing growth in general and housing for all income levels. Um, we've grouped COGS and MPOs here together because in many regions, MPOs and COGS um, are the same, that's in the San Joaquin Valley, um, and work together in, um, in, allocating, in allocating those resources and making those decisions. Finally, a CSD is a community service district that can have a variety of, of powers and authorities, including drinking water, wastewater, lighting, um, stormwater drainage, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what about me? Again, kind of reiterating, how do we make sure that the interests of cities, counties, unincorporated communities, disadvantaged communities, tribal interests are, are included in GSAs and GSPs? Next, next slide. Um, and why is it so important to get involved now? Um, governance structures, our GSAs are being developed now. Are the principles that will drive uh, groundwater sustainable plans now are being discussed. Um, kind of voices are at the table, so if yours isn't, um, your, your interests may not be represented. Um, who's best to elevate your jurisdiction's interests? If a neighboring city is at the table, does that necessarily mean that your interest is represented? Um, if a neighboring county is, is at the table, uh, is your community's voice at the table as well. Again, encourage not just the participation of the city and county staff, but of other local agencies and residents in your communities. Next slide. Um, so how to find out what's happening and where it's happening. Um, identify who in your region, uh, which, which entities are convening groundwater sustainability agencies. Um, as Trevor discussed, um, Several agencies have filed or will file notices with DWR. That's one way to find out if you've been involved in integrated regional water management plans or integrated regional water management groups. Many of the, the, the entities that led those efforts are now leading GSA development. Many counties are involved. Um, counties should be involved. So counties should know who best to contact. And, um, and we um, can help as well identify those parties. Um, and at the very least, make sure that you are on the list of interested stakeholders um, as uh, when G before GSP development starts, GSAs must notify all interested parties of, 
of updates, important documents, when meetings are happening, etc. I think that is it. Feel free to contact, of course, if you have any questions. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, and before we move on to our last speaker, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have any questions or comments, to so please put that, uh, type that into the comment section, and uh, we will get to that as soon as we wrap up our last speaker. Um, so you can, if you want to do that now, uh, please feel free. We'll be looking at those, and we will facilitate a Q&A after our last speaker. So our next speaker is Jennifer Clary. She is the Program Associate for Clean Water Action. Jennifer has served as the Water Program Manager for Clean Water Action's California program since 2003. She works to advance key water quality and funding policy in California, address barriers to safe drinking water in California communities, and serves on key stakeholder committees that advise state agencies on actions to monitor and protect groundwater quality and invest in water infrastructure. Jennifer is a well-known Bay Area environmental advocate and holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from UC Berkeley. And I will turn it Thank over you. to Jennifer. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I was asked to talk a little about, about public health and stakeholder engagement. And I just think it's obvious, So, but I thought I'd give you an example of where I think public health and stakeholder engagement intersect so we can talk about how it can, how we can advance public health um, through SIGMA implementation. Next slide, please. So um, this is a slide that you've already, this is information you've already seen from Trevor, and I just want to point out that um, counties and water agencies um, and municipalities are all local agencies that can qualify for being part of a groundwater sustainability agency, but there's something missing, and that is um, local stakeholder engagement. And that's not so, it's specifically included from governance, so we have to figure out how to include it elsewhere. Next slide, please. And who can be excluded from this? Well, I, as a first glance, Californians who aren't served by a public water system um, have a hard time participating in a lot of decision making, and that's up to two and a half million Californians. And those that remember, public water system under the Safe Drinking Water Act is a system that serves at least 25 people year round, or at least 15 connections. And so, there's quite a few people who aren't, who may not be represented in the process. Next slide, please. Um, and I just to kind of illustrate this, this um, graph shows well drilling logs. And well drilling logs have to be filed with the state whenever you drill a new well. So there's about 800,000 of them. That's not how many are up here. But if you take a look at who's drilling wells, the largest number in most areas of the state are domestic wells. And they don't, they're very tiny, they don't serve nearly as much water as an irrigation well or a public supply well, but it's a significant um, player in groundwater. So it's something, so it's definitely an argument to include them. Um, next slide, please. So I'm using nitrates as an example. Nitrates are the most um, common man-made contaminant in groundwater. It's number two or number three, I'm not sure yet because of hexavalent chrome, but it's a significant contaminant in many parts of the state. And it's got its drinking water standard of 45 parts per million because it's an acute contaminant, which means one um, dose, one drink, particularly for small children and infants, can cause illness or fatalities. And that means if you exceed the drinking water standard, you don't get a slap on the wrist, you have to tell your customers not to drink the water. So it's a very serious drinking water standard. Now, it's perceived differently by different people. If you're a public water system that has multiple um, sources, you monitor your well that's high in nitrates, and when it gets high enough, usually about 80 to 85 percent of the drinking water standard, you're going to make a decision about whether you're going to treat, put treatment on the well or blend it with another source or replace that source of water. And that's, it's a, it's a decision you make. Agriculture, it's like free money having nitrogen in the water, that you need nitrogen to grow a crop. And that's, so it's a benefit for them. 
a small water system, it's catastrophic because it is prohibitively expensive to treat and it's very difficult to find a clean alternative source and most small water systems have just a single source of drinking water. Next slide, please. So to give you some information on that from USGS, this is just, I'm just kind of describe how they measure things. They've been doing, they've been surveying water quality and creating information on it for about a dozen years. And when they monitor wells in a certain area or, or collate information, they create a circle. The circle is made up of the entire universe of water quality information. If it's blue, it means it's less than half of the maximum contaminant level. Green is between 50 and 100 percent of the maximum contaminant level. That portion of the circle in yellow exceeds the maximum contaminant well. That's the p percentage of wells that exceed the drinking water standard. Next slide, please. So looking at nitrate levels around the state, you can see that there are parts that where it's pretty insignificant and areas where a quarter or more of the wells are at least 50% of the standard. And, but it's usually not more than 12% that exceed the drinking water standard, even in the most significantly impacted areas. However, most of this information comes from pu public water supply wells, because that's where most of our water quality data comes from. The USGS was actually able to parse out this data in the Tulare Lake Basin, if you go to the next slide. And what you'll be able to see is that there's a difference between shallow wells and deep wells. And if you have a deep well, there's really not, not much of a problem with nitrate. But if you have a well that's less than 200 feet deep, which is pretty much all domestic wells and most, community, most small water systems, that is less than 200 connections, then you, are, you, you have a 40% chance of exceeding the nitrate standard if you're in Tulare County. And that's a significant problem. So if you think about, so think about who's sitting at the table when you're creating that GSA. Um, and go to the next slide, please. Um, the, the key to the groundwater sustainability plans is avoiding undesirable results. But an undesirable result is not any water quality degradation or any groundwater overdraft. It's that level that's considered significant and unreasonable. Well, if you're in agriculture, nitrogen isn't a problem. If you're a public water supply system, it's not much of a problem. But if you're a small water system or in a private well, it's a big problem if you're in the Tulare Lake Basin. So that kind of illustrates the importance of including a broad range of interests in your groundwater sustainability plan development and your stakeholder engagement. So next slide, please. So as we are looking at this, this uh, SIGMA requirements have specific requirements for public participation and for stakeholder engagement. And public participation is something that um, public agencies are very good at. It's required. Um, you know how to contact people. Everyone has lists. You have a lot of different agencies that do outreach. Sigma goes a little farther. It says you need to encourage the active involvement of diverse social, cultural, and economic elements of the population. That means you need to think about who am I looking for and how do I reach them. And I think I think there's a lot of experience in that amongst local agencies. And I look that's why it's really important to have counties and municipalities engaged in this process because they have greater familiarity than counties do. Next slide, please. Over and above the public participation requirement, you have a stakeholder engagement requirement. And that requires you to look at who actually uses or is affected by groundwater management and identify those interests and then identify people who represent those interests and include them in the process. And that requires a lot more thinking and a lot more outreach and engagement. Next slide, please. Um, so here, here's my, my shameless plug, and that is Clean Water Fund, Community Water Center, and Union of Concerned Scientists have been thinking about this for a while. And in July, we created um, a white paper on stakeholder engagement in sustainable groundwater management. And we created basically a list of who, how, and why. Like who do you engage, how do you engage them, why do you engage them. And we tried to create a lot, uh, identify a lot of 
case studies in water management so that people under, can understand that this is not rocket science. It's something that's going on now, and it's just a matter of good planning. Next slide, please. So the benefits of stakeholder engagement are pretty clear and, and again, related to public health. Improved outcomes, if you have people at the table who are impacted, they're more likely to have their needs addressed. You can, if you can optimize resources, everyone brings different skills to the table. And if you can work together, you're going to get where you're going. And the third thing is to build broad support. And the, Sustainable groundwater management is going to be very difficult in some areas, and to the extent that you can get people on board with the process early, you're going to have a more successful program and plan. Next slide, please. And so just to give you some examples, I thought I'd just do storytelling for most of it. So improving outcomes, this idea of um, impacted communities, um, the Tulare Lake Basin Disadvantaged Community Study was a four-county effort to identify um, small communities and their water related needs and is part of the Irwin process and the governance system was key to doing that because you had su a combination of supervisors and impacted community members so four supervisors four impacted community members so you had the people who had the problem and the people who could solve the problem sitting at the same table it created a pretty successful outcome next slide please and the idea of optimizing resources, um, I think, is really good in the Consume This American Bear and Yuba Integrated Wa Regional Water Management Plan, CABI for short. And they basically have a large number of, they have a, they have a good um, planning group that has both NGOs and water agencies and local government on it. And everyone brings their different expertise to the table. Water agencies are able to provide consistent support because they have cash flow, um, NGOs do a lot of the grant application and management because that's something they specialize in and it's been a pretty successful pro process. You can look on their website and they have a pretty extensive and impressive plan. Next slide, please. And then the other idea is trying to avoid conflict. And if you look at like the Sacramento Water Forum, next slide, please. If you look at the Sacramento Water Forum or I went a little farther, or the, um, thanks, or the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. Um, these are both entities that brought a lot of people together to talk to each other in order to avoid potential conflict in Pajaro Valley. They're trying to avoid seawater intrusion and so they could maintain water supply for all the ag in the area, Sacramento Water Forum was a successful, is, it continues to be a successful way for uh, water agencies, and environment, and business interests to work together to solve their different challenges. Next slide, please. And so what we're recommending for stakeholder, the basic components of stakeholder engagement are identifying your stakeholders, developing your outreach and communication, um, good and strong data management and information sharing, str uh, decision making, open decision making, and adaptive management. Next slide, please. So under so as an example of stakeholder identification and analysis, analysis, we looked at Sonoma Valley Groundwater Management Program, which has been going on for a few years and has a facilitated process where they identify stakeholders, have substantive interviews, get um, guidance from those interviews about who else they should contact, and they developed a really robust stakeholder um, program based on just on that work. Next slide, please. The idea of doing outreach and communication, I think one of the, we looked at the North Coast Irwimp, the original plan didn't include tribes, even though there's about three dozen recognized tribes in the region. So an NGO actually did outreach to all the tribes on their own, got about two dozen tribes to sign a petition to the board asking to be included in governance. And they were, the Irwimp agreed to include them in the governance. They didn't give them two dozen seats, they gave them three seats. And so then the tribes created an internal process for sharing the responsibility of those seats and ensuring that everyone's interests were part of the process. Next slide, please. And then under data collection and management, going back to the Tulare Lake Dis Disadvantaged Community Water Study, they actually now have an online um, database of all the 504 water systems 
or water or communities that they identified and so you have information about all those communities and that's something that didn't exist before many of those communities aren't represented by a public water system um, and so this is a way to, to to really be able to find out what's going on and really have those communities be represented in a process and have their needs be part of the discussion next slide please And decision making in Yomono maybe is probably not something they can use for Sigma because everyone, every entity who wants to join, all they have to do is sign an MOU and they're a voting member. And it's just an idea of how do you engage the most people in the process? Because if you can engage more people, then you're able to keep them interested and involved and um, have them be uh, part of the decision. Next slide, please. And then the final thing is adaptive management. And I think the one thing that we miss because we're also busy trying to implement this is the idea that this is going to last a very long time. Um, entities have until 2040 or 2042 to reach sustainability. And then after that, of course, they'll have to continue managing sustainably. So how do you engage people for the long term? And what you do is you is you have a process, an iterative process where you go over and over again. And CABI, again, is a good example because they had a very successful early integrated regional water management governance program, and it got kind of stale, and they had to go back and reinvent it. And they did, and they've been really successful. They've raised about $12 million for their local CABI, for their local um, projects since they reorganized. So just to say it never, never ends. So next step. Next slide, please. So just some real quick recommendations on stakeholder engagement. And we're asking that every groundwater sustainability plan include a communications plan that will actually guide and measure your outreach efforts. Um, if, you, if, you, if you just kind of say, I'm gonna, we're going to talk to everybody, that's not really enough. And then a bigger issue and a bigger question that's going to be different in every region is how do you provide stakeholders a role in decision making when your groundwater sustainability agencies are local agencies. And I think local local governments, especially counties and municipalities, have a big role to play in this because they do this already and water agencies, many water agencies don't. So I think you have a disproportionate responsibility in trying to ensure that this happens. And the next question is how do you engage the public and stakeholders on their own terms? If you have your meetings you know, every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, you're not, you're going to get the same people every Wednesday at 10 o'clock and you're not necessarily going to get the people who are most impacted. And that's just a big decision to make and something to incorporate in your communications plan. And the next question, of course, is you never quit. You always keep renewing it because people are going to fall out, people are going to come back in, and you want to find those fresh voices every time. So next slide, please. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them and you can find that report on the website of any of our organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Now I will turn it over to Danielle Dolan, who is our water program manager, who will be facilitating our Q&A portion. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join the webinar today. You still have some time to send in your questions. We'll get through as many as we can. We have a few right off the bat. First off, um, this could go to any of the three of you, Trevor, Jennifer, or Phoebe. Who from the city or county staff should be the person to lead the effort or seek engagement with the Groundwater Sustainability Agency? This is Phoebe, I'll start. Um, I, I think that um, it, it might depend on the city or county. Um, I think that there isn't maybe a person. I think public work should certainly be involved, but that that but that the land use and planning, the long-term planning, should definitely be involved um, in the planning agencies. Um, I would also love to see folks involved in housing to be involved. And I have to say that I think you need to have a decision maker. When you have an elected official at the table, then he's representing more than just his job. He's, you know, he knows that he has to represent everyone who elects him, so I, him or her. So I just think that's really important. 
Yeah, I really don't have anything to add. I mean, from a technical perspective, you know, environmental utilities, public utilities um, type folks certainly should probably be involved, but also decision makers. And you know, of course, we've heard from some cities and counties that they're they're not geared up for this. That that uh, perhaps they haven't played a role in water management in the past. But it really behooves them to to get involved, as you're aware. Um, because this is is really only going to be successful with county and city in, involvement. Thank you. So follow-up question to that. Where is the best place to find out if there's already a GSA forming in my region? Yeah, so this certainly is our arena here at Department of Water Resources you can see when the GSAs have formed um, and as they're listed within 15 days um, graphically and, and uh, in the table format on our website. However, you know, in terms of getting to that point, the formation, the starting of that formation, um, I think that kind of speaks to uh, a few slides. I can't remember if it was Jennifer, but that uh, you may want to reach out to the IRWM groups uh, in particular to see what's happening, you know, what, uh, what they've heard in terms of uh, GSA formation. Because the time it gets to us, it should be a, you know, fully thought out um, process and the formation should be, um, you know, essentially complete and already vetted. Thank you, Trevor. And how do you submit your name as an interested stakeholder? Jennifer, you want, my understanding or my experience has been that, um, that you submit to the conveners, whoever is developing the GSA. But um, I'm interested, in, Jennifer, if you've heard of other ways to make sure you're, you're identified as a stakeholder. Well, the, yeah, the, the legislation specifically says if you submit a request in writing to be considered an interested party, then you're added to the list. The question is if they haven't formed a GSA yet, who do you submit it to? And I say submit it to everyone you can think of because if you don't know what's going on yet, you have to do that. I suggest submitting it to your to see if you have a groundwater management agency already, and that's on Trevor's website. Um, Submit it to your local water agency because if they're not involved, they should be, and submit it to your board of supervisors because they'll likely be holding a hearing on it. I don't think there's a, in, until a GSA is created, you don't have a single go to place to submit that request. Thank you. And here's a question for clarification. Trevor, early in your presentation, you pointed out that, um, hang on, sorry. So if basins are already experiencing undesirable results that are significant and unreasonable, do they still have till 2040 to achieve sustainable yield? Or is there a different process for those basins that are already experiencing those yeah, that, that's a good question and gets right into the details in terms of you know, what's significant and unreasonable and when do local agencies or GSAs need to um, reach a st sustainable yield and avoid those significant and reasonable uh, conditions. And, you know, I think that there are areas certainly where agencies you know, we'll need to be honest and say, yeah, we're having significant and reasonable levels of subsidence today. I mean, or 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 one of the other uh, six, uh, five undesirable results. And in those cases, the it behooves them to get above a maybe a threshold in terms of what's significant and reasonable uh, as soon as possible, because really there's um, perhaps impacts that are occurring because of the uh, undesirable result conditions. Um, and we feel that it might be best that the discussion in terms of, you know, how to approach those issues and uh, develop a timeline for, um, you know, correcting, if you will, 
those uh, significant reasonable levels uh, should be done as part of that GSP development process. And I think this really gets to what Jennifer laid out, that it really is, again, probably behooves those local agencies to do this in a outreach process so that there can be some agreement on how to approach those issues. Um, but it quickly gets into to the details, and the legislation simply states that the sustainable yield must be achieved by 2040 or 42, depending again on what kind of basin you're in, and, and they shall be avoiding undesirable results. Thank you. And going back to the legislation in Government Code 65350.5, what does review and consider the GSP mean in regards to Sabine County General Plan amendments? So in the regulations, Trevor, will that be defined, what review and consider should look like? Let's see. Um, you know, I think um, some of this is in, well, this is specifically in government code. So this is a little uh, unique in that it's not a GSP regulation, or excuse me, a GSP uh, plan element. For example, on that slide that I was uh, laying some of the uh, the relevant code sections, um, you know, some are specifically applicable to the GSP regulations. Others are already listed in statute, uh, and so we're going to have to strike a balance between what is already existing in law and where we have authority uh, to provide some um, requirements as it relates to to existing code. Um, so we're we're working on that and 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 uh, working on maintaining that balance in terms of what's already in statute versus what should be in regulations. And Jennifer and Phoebe, do either of you have an, an interpretation of review and consider that you'd like to share with the audience? This is Phoebe. I think that it just doesn't make much sense for a general plan to not be consistent with a GSP. So um, I think that my interpretation, the interpretation I would definitely like to see is is conformity with the GSP and its goals. Jennifer, do you have anything to add? I defer to the other two. Similar question, what does consider all beneficial uses and users mean? Jennifer, do you want to take this? Or? Sure, I'll take this one. So the because the the legislation goes farther than just saying consider, they actually declare them in the later section to be interested parties and and as part of your GSA formation, you have to describe how they're going to be engaged in the process of developing the GSA and the and the GSP, ACC, the agency and the plan. So that's it's really pretty clearly laid out in statute. You know, and, and I'll add that um, you know we'll be interested in how stakeholders were involved, and there's also a 60-day um, period after adoption where um, public uh, comments can be essentially, I guess, uh, submitted on the plan. And we'll be interested in those comments on uh, on the development of the plan. So I think again, it it I. The models, some of the models that Jennifer described um, are possibly good models in terms of identifying stakeholders and, and establishing an outreach process so that, uh, you know, hopefully uh, there's a lot of support for how the plan uh, was developed. Great. And Trevor, this one's for you as well. Following up on the changes to Sigma from SB 13. In section 10726.8b, local agencies cannot impose fees or regulations outside their boundaries. So can you clarify what GSAs will actually have the authority to do and what fees they can levy? You know, I, I don't know if I can answer that question. I would need to uh, study that and kind of determine whether or not this is a question that frankly the department can answer or if this is um, 
more uh, from a local agency perspective to have their councils uh, look at in answer. Okay, and thank this you. Is, and this is Jennifer. I don't think that, I, I think there's some question about how this section is interpreted. So we think, you know, uh, the lawyers I've talked to think that this means that you can impose fees within the GSA territory, within the territory service area identified by the GSA, regardless of which local agencies make up that GSA, because the very act of forming that agency means that no one else has agreed to serve that area. So, I mean, I think that we're going to have some discussions about this moving forward. I, I think this may have muddied things up a little tiny bit. I'm going to refrain from comments, so I'm only moderating the questions here. Um, there is a question for you, Jennifer, regarding groundwater contamination. How do I find out if there are wells in my region that are contaminated? Well, you know, Gamma GeoTracker is actually online, and you can go to you can put in your address and um, look for wells within your area that have submitted groundwater quality information. Now, most private wells wouldn't have information online. There have been a few surveys done in a few counties, but by and large that information either doesn't exist or exists at the county level. But if you go to the state, if you Google State Water Board GeoTracker Gamma, you can go into their database, insert your address, and they'll show you um, well information and you can click on and find water quality. And one more question, is there a central location where I can find information about small water system? No, not really. Um, the, there, the state maintains a list of public water systems, but I don't think it's publicly accessible. If you go to the drinking water program page of the state water board, they maintain a list of problem water systems, small water systems. It's about 200 and it's going to go up to about 500 soon if it hasn't already done so. But there's actually, there's 7,500 public water systems in the state. About 700 of them deliver water to 95% of the population. And um, about two, a little more, a little less than two thirds of them are like just are don't deliver sub water supply to residences. It's like your local campground or restaurant. So it's a pretty it's a pretty substantial list. Great, thank you. That's all the questions we have for this afternoon. Trevor, Jennifer, and Phoebe, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? Get involved. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I think um, you know, one, one just again appreciate the opportunity to to present, and um, you know, GSP regulations in particular, there is a lot of uh, density to this topic. It's it, there's a lot to to uh, to work through, not only technically but uh, just technical requirements, but policy, um, and so you know we are. Um, diligently working on this, trying to create a regulation that's not going to be overly um, um, complex. Um, but the, the, the regulation will be um, maybe, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say controversial, but, but there will be a challenge to try to um, make folks uh, as, as happy as possible. So, um, what I guess I'm trying to say is, unlike Basin Boundaries, which we received a lot of support for, I think GSP regulations, it's going to be a, uh, a challenge, as, as some folks will find uh, elements that uh, they really uh, gravitate towards, and others will be uh, be challenged with, uh, with what's uh, perhaps missing or not included. Uh, so um, we like to say, don't let perfect uh, be the enemy of good because we are working to strike that balance and, and stay with our existing authority. And I just want to reiterate what Phoebe said. The the only way these these um, 
plans are going to be fair or implemented in an appropriate way is if we have broad representation in their development and implementation. So get engaged. Thank you to all three of you for sharing your insights with us today. Um, just a few closing comments on my part, some information I want to share with the rest of you on the line. Next slide, please. The Local Government Commission does have some resources available. We are providing drought response training to the 24 counties identified by the governor's office as most severely impacted by the drought. And if you visit our drought response page at lgc.org slash drought training or click the link on your webinar. You can see a list of the different topics we plan to provide training on. We just completed our first training which was Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper which was a 20-hour drought tolerant landscaping course. We plan on providing trainings on groundwater sustainability as a drought response and drought resilience tool as well as urban greening and maintaining your urban forests during the drought, community water conservation programs, and overall water use reductions within city or county operations. So please visit our website for more information about that. More relevant to the topic of our webinar today, we're working on some initiatives to do some groundwater outreach and technical assistance specifically for cities and counties. So I would love to hear from all of you on the line what specific needs you have, if there are tools or information or technical assistance or capacity building that you could use that would be helpful in better engaging in the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I would love to hear from you and see how we can help out. So please do not hesitate to contact me. And my contact information is now on the screen. We will also post a recording of the webinar and all the resources provided on our website within the next few days. And we will follow up with an email to all the participants as well. So thank you all again, and get involved in your regional groundwater efforts.